This video is about using Python's database API to interact with databases. And in particular, we're going to be interacting with Oracle using the CX Oracle module. Let's take a look at the uh, definition or the specification for the DB API. And this is what all the databases use. If you have a module that connects Python to a database, they will all implement minimally the Python database API. The goal of having a DB API is to achieve consistency and, for module designers so that they create the same type of an interface or the same type of an API, make it a little bit more portable across databases so that the same code will work for Oracle as it will for SQL Server. And uh, that's the basic goal of the DB API. Here are the four most popular databases, Oracle, Postgres, SQL Server, and MySQL. And an example of a, a module that implements the DB API. Now, the first question you might end up asking yourself is, well, should I Okay, I've got Oracle, but should I use CX Oracle or should I jump into SQL Alchemy, which is a extremely well-designed database uh, library for Python? Well, it depends on what you need to do. If you're working with a framework that requires an object relational mapping, then the SQL Alchemy ORM library is excellent for that. Uh, by the way, SQL Alchemy has two different libraries for two entirely different purposes. So when people just say I should use you should use SQL Alchemy, for example, you have to ask them, are you referring to the ORM library or the core library? Because they're completely different. This is for object relational mappings only. And even though this is arguably perhaps the best ORM out there, if you don't need to use an RM ORM, you probably shouldn't. If you understand SQL, you'll be better off. Um, than using the ORM in terms of the performance hit that, that the database will take, even with the best ORMs. But if you've got a framework that's helping you write your code faster, and it says, hey, we're gonna, we need an ORM, why not go for it? Core library is very similar to the DB API, except that it extends it, and they make it as consistent as possible across the various database systems. Also, instead of using SQL, they encode the SQL statements in a Pythonic way, so it's, uh, it's very much readable as SQL, but it's not exactly SQL when you look at it. But it makes a little more sense, and it's a little more easy to develop with as an expert Python developer. You might prefer to use SQL in this particular way. And of course, if you work with multiple database systems, and you've got a, an API that's more capable than DB API, why not use it? Because you don't want to have to rewrite the code for CX Oracle versus the implementation for Postgres, for example. That said, in practice, I've seen it very rarely happen that you want to take a, a given code base and port it to a different database backend. As a developer, if you learn SQL Alchemy, you can go from one uh, assignment to another, one job to another, and you'll be ready to write the same type of code. So it has that advantage as well. But if you're already a SQL expert and you don't know SQL Alchemy and you know you're working with Oracle, why not go with CX Oracle? So this talk is about CX Oracle and it does assume you understand SQL pretty well and that you're comfortable just writing a SQL string and you've made up your mind on Oracle. I'll do another um, such video for Postgres, similar to this one, but this one's for Oracle. So let's take a look at some of the CX, CX Oracle documentation. This is their home page um, for version 8, which is fairly new. Quick start to the installation. Now, in a previous video, I showed how to install CX Oracle. It requires installing the Oracle client libraries, among other things. But that's covered in a previous video. The CX Oracle documentation and a tutorial, which I actually have links for right here. This is the uh, tutorial. This is pretty good. Um, if what you want to learn is CX Oracle, 
But the, the Python that they use for their examples is not the best Python um, that you might want to see in production setting. But it does quickly um, show you how to use the various features of CX Oracle. But one of its main problems is it doesn't distinguish between those things that are used often and happen to be pretty easy to use versus those things that are pretty rare and aren't that easy to use or understand. So it gives you everything. Um, this is like more like a reference, even though they call it a tutorial, it's almost a reference. Um, so you need, I find you might, uh, many people need something a little more gentle introduction to get started. And then you can go on to this tutorial. And they include sample code uh, on GitHub. This is Oracle. And you've got all sorts of examples here that you can look at. For example, starting up, shutting down the database. Not something you would normally do from within Python. Um, how about a query? Just take a quick look at a query. Open, the, bring this up a bit. And here's an example SQL statement. You get a connection, you get a cursor, you execute that SQL statement, and then you get uh, rows back that you can look at. So that's an example of one of their sample files. I'll be showing you my own examples and going in much more detail on some of the code. And finally, if you're new to Oracle, this is a nice introduction to Oracle itself, getting started with the Oracle database views, indices, how to write stored procedures. This is pretty cool. Aggregate functions, analytic functions, doing a group by. If you're doing data science, you need to understand aggregates and group bys, which are very similar um, in all databases. Some of the extensions that they add are, are specific to a particular database, but most of this is the same. Uh, most of this is standard SQL. And even the way PL SQL is written, although it's specific brand of programming to store, of store procedures for Oracle, it too looks pretty similar to the store procedures in other databases. But this isn't really a class on Oracle. This is, this is on Python and CX Oracle. Briefly remind you of what we did in an earlier video so that we know where we're at as a starting point. We created, uh, we registered with Oracle so that we could pull down the uh, 12.2 Oracle Enterprise Edition, and we're using the slim version. Uh, since it's so large, I recommend that you pull it separately and deal with all the login and registration issues at one time. And once you've got that image down on your database, you can start on your host machine. You can start up this image as a container, which I've named Oracle DB. 1521 in the container gets mapped to the local host, create a, a persistence um, vo using a volume, a named volume, and we're up and running. So this is how we're using the Oracle database server. Now this particular video, I'm used doing everything under Windows WSL2, just to show that it can be done. It's actually the same as it is under Linux or VM running Linux, but I find that if I do it under Windows, I will probably convey the fact that it really is the same because this is actually going to use Windows. We installed SQL Plus and the Oracle client libraries, and we installed dBeaver, which is something like SQL Developer, although I actually like it better, and it's free and it works with all the databases. And what, continuing on what we did in a previous video, we created a user. I'm not dealing with any of these fancy files. I'm not talking about Oracle administration. So no TNS names.ora or .NET files or anything like that, which means the connect string is a little bit longer, but it's simpler to deal with. And this is not an Oracle DBA uh, class. So we log on with SQL plus as this DBA, we created our user. We granted privileges to that user. And then we got an example database, an open source database that's often used um, on the internet by other databases that you have got Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, and other databases have got this exact same example. So it's helpful to have the same code. It's on GitHub in many different places because it is open source. I chose it from this particular repo. 
and I like their version of it. I think it's slightly cleaner, although it should be effectively identical to any other version of the Sakula database. Postgres calls this the DVD rental database, by the way, if you've heard that particular term. So we uh, connected as our as users Sakila, and we went ahead and created the schema and inserted the data. Again, these last three sides are just showing us what we did in a previous video and where we're at. We've got the Oracle container, which is the database server up and running, and we put data into it. And of course, that data is persisted on the host, as discussed in previous videos, by way of Docker volumes. All right, finally, Python with CX Oracle. Okay, so we're going to go through a couple of examples here. Basically, you need to connect to the database, and then you need to get a cursor object off that connection, and then you use that cursor object to execute your SQL. And once you've executed your SQL query on the server, you need to fetch the roads back from the server to the client. Again, in this case, the server is actually a Docker container running Oracle database enterprise edition. We can fetch one row at a time. Not likely that that's what we want, but we can do it. We can fetch n rows at a time. We can fetch all the rows and we can do other variations that are similar to this. But these are three of the most common ways of getting data back after having executed a query on the server. So now let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and bring up. So this is um, Windows Terminal, which is a nice, much nicer terminal than the default terminal. I've got it set up so that when I, not sure why that's there, so that when I first bring it up, I go directly to my WSL2 system and to my home directory under Ubuntu, it's essentially cat Etsy star release star. And this is a 20.04.1 LTS Ubuntu system in at WSL2 on Windows. So I created a project directory and a CX Oracle directory. And let's go ahead and bring up code via Visual Studio Code in the current directory so we can start looking at some actual code examples. And so let's do the simplest possible program, which is simply we're going to connect to the database. So we got our user, we have a password. Now, of course, I've written that password in clear text, which is not what you would do in a production situation. At a minimum, you would get this from an environmental variable, but there are other ways to encode this such that it's hard, so it's more secure. Now, if you're running this solely on, on a production server inside a firewall at a corporate site, it's probably pretty secure anyway, but you still should never use plain text. Um, that's just to make this example easier. For the password. It's going to be running on local host because our Docker container mapped 1521 in the container to 1521 on our local host. So it looks like our database server is running on our local host. And inside our container, in a previous video, we found out this was our service name. So we just type in the service name, which by the way is not case sensitive. This allows us to connect. We're going to put this inside of a try except finally because we want to catch the errors. Um, we want to know that or ORA number that you get when you make a mistake with Oracle. So you might get a database error when you're trying to connect. And if you do get a Oracle CX Oracle database error, this uh, nomenclature syntax will get you the actual ORA code as a number. This will get it as, as a string. So you're, you're still fine. I'll show an example of that momentarily. So you try, and of course, the finally gets run regardless of whether or not the try block succeeded. Uh, now note in this particular setup, a little more space here, I set the connection equal to none. I then try to connect to Oracle. If this actually fails, then connection remains set to none, and there's nothing to close. If it succeeds, but I do some other operation in this try block that throws an exception, I would then have an open connection that I need to close. So this is kind of the idiom here. Set the connection equal to none in case this fails, and then I can then I know I don't need to close something that never actually got opened. 
Otherwise, in the finally block, we're going to go ahead and close that connection. And I'm going to go ahead and show that. It's easier to actually see this rather than talk it through. This actually put in a bad uh, service name. And let's just run it in the debugger and, and actually step through the flow of control. Okay, so I've gone down into main. By the way, this code is import CX Oracle. I defined a method that I'm not yet using, or a function, I should say, standalone functional. And uh, if the name of the module is equal to main, which it will be because we're executing the main module, we call main. And we come down here and start off the actual, actual code. Let's go ahead and try and get a connection. Now, I, this is not the right service name. I'm demonstrating how the try accept block actually works. And it takes, it, and we've thrown an exception. Now we're going to test to see is this exception a database error or a subclass of database error? And in fact, it is. So we can print out the error message. So this is the string that we get back, which includes as part of the string the aura number 12514. The listener does not currently know of, a ser of service requested, and that's because this is the wrong service name. So that's why we get that message. And I just this, this I'm just throwing out there in case you actually want the 12514 as an integer that you want to work with. Um, this, this is an actual integer that picks off that number. We had an exception, but we fall down to the finally block. We didn't actually open a connection, so that's not going to be true. There's nothing to close. We've come, we're popping out on the, off the stack back into, the, into main, and we're done with our program. So that's an example of what it looks like. Now, of course, if we actually give it the correct one, um, let's run through. I'll run through the correct one, but also let's add a new method. So we'll actually get the connection, and then we're going to go ahead and call a function on that connection. Again, I'm just going through this in the debugger because it's a little easier to understand the control flow when you see it step by step. So we've connected to the Oracle database. Now let's call this function. and this particular connection has several fields off of it. We can look at the version. Now this is the Oracle server version. So this is 12.2, sometimes called Oracle Enterprise Edition 12C R2. We can look at what username did we use to log in. And we can look at the auto commit, for example. By default, the auto commit is off, which is zero. If you want to turn it on, you put, give it a one. We can look at the character encoding, which is UTF-8, and we can look at, okay, what client is running this CX Oracle client? And uh, it's version 8.0.1. We're down, done with our try block. We come down to finally. We did open a connection. We go ahead and close that connection, pop off the stack to main, and end our program. So that's an example of about as simple a database program as you can get using CX Oracle and the Oracle server. Next, let's go ahead and run a query. Okay. So the same connect string. This code's identical, except now we're calling a different function. And let's go ahead also and follow the flow of control through this. I'm going to step into the query function. And then I'm creating a try accept block that is essentially the same as the one we had in main. We we're trying to get a connection to Oracle. This try accept block is getting a cursor off that connection. So I first set the cursor to none in case this fails. And then in the finally block, I'll close the cursor if, in fact, we opened it. And none, by the way, the Boolean value of a none, of course, is false. So if this is none, it's, a, it's equivalent to if false, and we don't actually close it. This is a common Python idiom, by the way, to not test to see cursor equal equal none, but rather just plain if cursor, and if it's none, it'll be automatically converted to a Boolean, which is, in fact, false. 
I'm trying not to use advanced Python here, but I do want to use the most common Python idioms that are used by professional Python developers. So that's why the code looks the way it does. Let's go ahead and get a connection. So I just created a query and I'm about to execute that query. Now, whenever you're developing um, SQL for use in a Python or any programming language, you almost always are going to be using a IDE, a SQL IDE. And this one, I've already opened up a connection to Oracle, but let's just briefly look at the uh, connection information. And again, this was shown in a previous video. So we're connecting to localhost 1521. Here's our service name, same as what we had in the main function and our user and our password. I can come down here and look at the schemas. Now I've got a filter on the schemas such that I'm only looking at this particular one. Otherwise, there's a lot of other ones that might show up. Look at the tables. And we're running a query on actor. Let's take a look at the actor table and look at its columns. And we can see, OK, first name and last name, as you might expect, are var jars. And we're selecting all of those that have a last name of Ackroyd. By the way, this particular database has made up data. It may refer to some real actors on occasion, but the movie names are made up and the descriptions are made up. And they're, they're basically humorous, but they're not real, just so you know. And I could go ahead and hit Control Enter right here, and I'll execute that first statement. And we see we get back three rows from our actor table in this Aquila schema. By the way, again, this is sometimes called the DVD rental database. And you can also, by the way, DBeaver allows you to actually see um, an ER diagram. And that can be helpful to understand the, the relationships one to many, many to many with an intermediate table to handle that. And uh, everything else that you might want to see. <laughs> um, let's go back to here. This is a very powerful IDE. I'm not going to show off how to use it, except to say that it can do just about anything you can think of that has to do with SQL and dealing with the metadata that describes your tables and columns. So this is what we're expecting to get back. Again, it's much easier to use this SQL IDE than to try to debug this stuff, debug your SQL in Python. So we debug the SQL here. Once we get it the way we want it, then we copy it into our Python code. That's just the uh, easiest way to do development. Okay, so let's go ahead and execute this query. This query, again, was identical to the one I just showed you. So we've executed the SQL on the server. Now we need to fetch the data from the server back to our client and do something with it. In this example, we're just gonna go ahead and fetch one particular row, the first row that the server happened to get. Since we had an order by that, that defines the order of the rows that are being returned. We can go ahead and print that row and we get Christian Ackroyd, which of course, in our dbeaver session, Christian Ackroyd was the first record returned. We only returned one record because we only fetched one record. And what is the structure of this row object? It's really just a tuple that has the first the value of the first name and the value of the last name. That's all it is. Go ahead and fetch the next record and print it. And we're done. The cursor was open successfully, so we close it. So we return the resources back to the database system. And then we pop off the stack here and we're ending the try block that was up in our main. And we did open a connection to the database, so we go ahead and close it. So that was our entire program in which we actually ran a query against the database and got data back and printed it. Now let's move on to the second example. These are just incremental changes um, so that we can see it slightly differently uh, several different times. And we're gonna go ahead and put the breakpoint in the same location and run through the code. You can do this in less steps, but there's nothing wrong with this way of doing it either in terms of starting off the debugging process. We set cursor equal to none. 
Again, we already connected. I've shown that before. I, I put the breakpoint inside the query function. Go ahead and execute the same query. Now this time we're going to actually fetch more than one row. In fact, we're going to say, how many rows do we want? We want two rows. So we're going to get two rows. Note that I use the local variable rows plural because now we have a list of rows. That's by default what you get back when you run this piece of code. It's a collection, which happens to be a list. For each row in the rows, let's go ahead and print that row. So first name, last name, and again, the row is a tuple of values. And we'll print the first name and the last name. And as before, we close the cursor and close the connection. And we're done. Let's go ahead and do another example. Slightly more complicated this time, but pretty much the same. And go ahead and kick off the debugger and run into this particular breakpoint. And then it step into or all right. What's different about this SQL statement? This is a placeholder. Colon last name is a placeholder. It's a named placeholder that has the name, of course, last name. And we're going to fill in the name. We're going to get the name somewhere else. Um, it could come from user input or another program. But somehow we got this from some other source, and we're going to run this query using this name, and it's put in here as a placeholder. Now, this is the correct way of executing a SQL statement in which you have a placeholder. Um, you should never actually use the Python string formatting or string concatenation with user input to create a SQL string that you execute on the server because you don't know what the user is going to put in there and they could do something that compromises your system. So that would be called a SQL injection attack. And that's what we are avoiding by using a bind variable. Also, it's more efficient to do this um, if you have a if the code gets executed a large number of times you can actually this code can be prepared and like pre-compiled on the database server side and it'll run much more quickly so that's where we are this is an example of how you then execute it so before we did execute sql this time we do an execute sql and we give it the name that we used for our placeholder, which was last name. Then we supply it with a value or a variable that contains that var va value. So this will go ahead and execute the SQL statement. This is a fetch all. So fetch all rows from the server. So you better be sure that's not too many because you don't want to be bringing back um, uh, 10 million or 100 million rows from the server to the client. Uh, that's almost never what you want to do. You would bring them back in batches, and there's various ways to deal with large number of rows that you process, but that's a topic for another time. In this case, we know there's only three rows, so we can get them all at once. For row and rows, it's print each row, and it works just fine. Don't worry about these characters here. This comes up because when I use a hotkey for my desktop recorder, uh, it unfortunately ends up inserting those characters. So just ignore that, this stuff. Don't pay any attention to it, even though I highlight it. Okay. And close the cursor as before and close the connection as before. I'm going to just go, this time, however, I'm going to go back through this and make a couple of mistakes on purpose so that we can see the try accept block working properly. Let's, let's say we gave it a field name that doesn't exist and go ahead and run this that's our sql statement and we try to execute it and let's see what happens it throws an exception we capture that exception we print the error and it says invalid identifier okay Oracle's not known for having the best, the clearest errors, but at least last name ZZZ, we can look back and see, oh, that was part of our SQL statement. I must have given it a field name that's actually not in that table. Let's go ahead and run this to the end of the program and let's make a different type of error. Let's say that although we gave it a placeholder of last name, 
let's say we um, said we used the wrong placeholder name when we tried to execute it. So this is just another error. Again, this is what I'm going through here is good practice to be sure that when you set up your try accept blocks, you exercise them to be sure you're capturing all the types of errors that may happen so that when it does happen in production, you're not surprised at how your logic works. Go ahead and run this. We threw the Oracle through an exception. And this time it says illegal variable name or number. So the illegal variable name was our placeholder name. Our placeholder was supposed to be last name and we used something else. Go ahead and run through to the end. So again, as mentioned, you should not construct a SQL string using string formatting. And um, let's go ahead, can I just copy that? And Take a look at this. So I'm in Oracle read the docs, SQL queries, and it's saying what I just said basically. Um, interpolating or concatenating user data with SQL statements is a security risk and impacts performance. Use buying variables instead. So that's what we did. And let's actually just run through the whole thing without using a debugger from start to finish with no errors in the code. And we see we get the three records that we got in the Beaver. So that'll do it for the, this example. And our next example is a brief review of a couple of Python data types that we need to understand if we're gonna be working with data types that come back from the database. So of course, Oracle has a decimal data type and so does Python. Oracle has dates and times and time intervals and so does Python. So briefly take a look at the Python side of things to be sure we understand how this works. And I'm just gonna run through it. I think it's easier to, to understand it when you actually see it. So we created a decimal of exactly 10 cents. Usually you're using a, a, a scale of two when you have a monetary uh, value. And so let's just call this dollars and cents, 10 cents and 20 cents, add them together and you have 10 cents plus 20 cents is 30 cents. Nothing surprising there. Now there's a lot of Python string format specifiers, and this is the best summary I've seen yet for all of them. Now it doesn't talk about F strings, the new uh, way of doing uh, formatting in Python 3.6 and above, but all the F strings um, work exactly the same as the dot format, or I should say the format specifiers work the same for dot format as they do with an F string. So you'll understand how to create your F string just by reading this document, even though they never mentioned the word F string. So this rather odd looking syntax, um, bang R says, I wanna see the representation of this value. In other words, how would you create it with a, a constructor? So let's go ahead and print that line of code. And the representation for A, A is an object of type decimal and the way you would construct it, well, it's the same way we did construct it. And so when we print it like this, we get to see its representational format. We see decimal 10, dot, dot 10, dot 20, and dot 3 is equal to dot 30. Again, no surprise, uh, that's what we would expect. Now, some people are surprised that if I just create a floating point number of 0.1 and 0.2, and I add them, I get something that's not 0.3. And that has to do with the fact that you can't represent 0.3 exactly in binary. It's just not possible to represent it. So it has to be a tiny, tiny, tiny bit off. Now the problem is, if, if you're using a money data type, occasionally you could have this rounding error or actually the main problem is that you com exact comparisons don't work. That's the where we're at right now. So we're expecting, um, I added, 0.1 to 0.2, I expect it to equal 0.3. Does it? No, it doesn't. It equals 
and the tiny, tiny, tiny bit more. So you should avoid exact comparisons with floating point numbers. And that's true in all programming languages. Th this exact same problem happens because the uh, IEEE standard for how to represent um, floating point numbers and how to do arithmetic on them yields the exact same issue in all the programming languages that I'm aware of, which is a half dozen or so. So that's, that's why we can't use floating point numbers to represent monetary values. Even though the value will be very, very close, you almost always want to represent a monetary value as a decimal, both on the Oracle when you declare the column in your table, and of course when you get it back from Oracle into your Python code, you want it to be a Python decimal data type. A brief example of Python's um, date time. Get the time now, we create a, create a time delta of 12 days, print the current date and time, October 21st, 10.05, PM and uh, 12 days from now it'd be November 2nd, 10.05 PM. And of course there's quite a different a number of different ways you can format, get a string representation of a date or a date time. And that's all described in the STIRF time documentation. And here's one example of how to do that. So again, what we did here basically is we just briefly reviewed Python's decimal data type and Python's date time and time delta in preparation for dealing with Oracle's decimal data type and Oracle's time stamp or date time fields. And let's move on to the next code example. Again, main is the same as it's been in all of these. It calls the query. And, and I've got a breakpoint here. Let's go ahead and just run this until we get to the breakpoint. Go ahead and get the cursor object off of the connection object after successfully connecting to Oracle. Now I'm going to be choosing different fields and this particular query I've already got set up in dBeaver. That's this query right here. Let's go ahead and run this query and see what it looks like. And we're, we're selecting from the film table. So let's take a look at the film metadata. And we see film ID is a number 38 comma zero. Now that's equivalent to a zero when you, excuse me, that's equivalent to an integer. When you've got zero for the scale, that means it's essentially an integer. Title is a var char. Description is a CLOB, a, a character large object. The rental rate, clearly the rental rate is the amount of money it costs to rent the DVD. Obviously, this is a little bit of an old um, example, but it's a well-designed and free example. So a lot of um, tutorials online will use the DVD rental database. So the rental rate, of course, is a monetary value. So we're going to want to make sure that when we get this data back into Python, we handle it at, properly. The original language ID, which is an uh, integer. Again, number 38 comma zero is effectively an integer. And last update, which of course is a date. So this is what we're selecting. We can see these integers. We can see some titles. Again, this is whole made up data. A description, um, just looking at the first part of the description. Presumably they decided to use a CLOB because a description for a film could, in theory, be more than 4,000 characters long. Here's, again, this is a string representation that we're looking at, a text representation of the rental rate and the last update. But we know that this is actually a date field and this is actually a number four comma two field. Let's actually just look at that. We can see it when we highlight it. But if I double click on it, we can also see that the position is four and the scale is two, and that it does not accept null values when the table was created. Okay, so that's what this query is all about. When we get records back, we expect them to look like 
we're seeing right here in this particular result set. So let's go back to our code. Go ahead and execute that query. Let's get the first five rows. It's not good when the comments get out of sync with the actual code. That's why you should avoid comments unless you actually need them. Of course, you need more comments when you're explaining something. We got back five rows and let's look at the first row in those five rows. And again, rows is a list of tuples and the tuple is, a, is the values uh, for each field that we selected. Go ahead and print that. The film ID, the film title. Hmm, this is a strange object, so we're gonna have to figure out how to deal with this. A CX Oracle.lob on the Python side of things. 2.99, now we can't tell by looking at that whether that's a float or a decimal, so we're gonna have to do more work to decipher what data type this actually is. It's monetary, so we'd like it to be a Python decimal data type. None, well, that's how null values are represented when you bring them back from the database to Python. They have the value of none, which really is very much like a null value in Python. So that's a good representation for null values. And the Python date time is a little awkward, but date time, dot date time, year, month, day, hour, minute, and second. So that's what we've got. Let's go ahead and do another one. And so on. So let's go down to here. So this is a list comprehension. Now list comprehensions at, to the beginner look more difficult than a for loop. But once you get used to them, it's actually more concise and it conveys the information about what the program is doing actually more quickly and succinctly to a professional Python developer. So although I'm not trying to write complicated or advanced Python here, it is important to use those constructs that a typical professional Python programmer would use, and they would definitely use a list comprehension in this particular situation. So I got it back a bunch of rows. Well, the, the zeroth row, of course, is the first row. And so for, which means we're going to get, so the first row is a, is a tuple. For each value in that tuple, let's find out what the Python data type is and put this in a list comprehension. So we're creating a list and put this, so data types then becomes a list, um, an ordered list of the types of each value. And when we step through this, interestingly enough, it goes through it about uh, as many times as we had fields that we selected. The next thing we're gonna look at here, let me actually just go and uh, that particular link. So now we're back at PEP 249. This is the Python description description of the DB API. And when you use the cursor to execute a query, you get back metadata on that off of that cursor. And you get back up as many, well, you get back seven fields. Not all of them are going to be defined. They may, some of them may be null, but you get back seven fields of metadata for each field that you asked for from the database. You get back the field name, which you might expect because it's going to be helpful a type code, um, which tells you what the data type is on the Oracle side of things. If it's a number, you'll also get back precision and scale and whether or not null values are allowed. So this is the metadata that we're getting back automatically in the cursor.description uh, field. So if we pick off just, and, and if we had about, what was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, six fields we requested so we're going to get six fields worth um, six fields worth of metadata and each piece of metadata actually has seven fields in it if we pick off the first one as we just saw the very first one was the field name so again for each of the seven or six fields that we are querying for 
we get past back seven pieces of metadata. We're picking off the first one only, put it inside a list comprehension, and then we have a list of field names. So run that a couple times. This is also common Python, but, um, but it's not something you have to use. It's nice to create a dictionary in which the keys are the field names and the values are the Python data types. It just makes it easier to, to show you what's going on. So, and you can create a dictionary from a list of keys and a list of values using this particular idiom. Dictionary, zip together our column vector, if you want to call it that, and our other column vector. And now we've got a dictionary. Let's go ahead and print it. You don't have, you don't have to do this. This was just uh, a convenient way of associating the names with the Python data type. So we found that the film ID was of class integer. So CX Oracle said the best Python data type for this, uh, I think it was a number 38 comma zero on Oracle is integer. And that's a, that makes sense. It is an integer, it is the best data type. That's what we want. It chose what we would hope it would. Title was a varchar 255, if I recall. And it says, okay, why don't we use the Python data type of string for that database data type of varchar 255 or varchar anything, really. It's going to come back as a string. This isn't exactly what we're looking for because this is kind of hard to work with. We would like this to be a string. And if you look in the CX Oracle documentation, it says, well, if you've got a character large object that's less than oh, roughly a gigabyte or so, which is about 330,000 pages of text, if you've got a little bit less than, anything less than say 330,000 pages of text, you really should just be using um, a Python data type of string. So we're gonna see how to convert this to a string the rental rate instead of the default. So right now this is the default and this is not easy to work with. The rental rate, it converted by default to a float, but we just saw that with money, you really don't wanna be dealing with a float data type because the rounding and all of that presents a problem. It may present a problem. In your particular application, it may not matter. But if you're dealing with accountants who don't like things off by a penny, if they see something off by a penny, that's not a business problem, but they're going to say, I don't think your code's working right because I did I added up the values in my book and they don't match what you've got. Yours is a penny different, so I think your code is wrong. So you need to be very careful. Um, I've dealt with many accountants uh, in my career and you really need to be careful on money values and be right to the penny, even though the penny doesn't, because it doesn't mean, it means that you're not doing it correctly if you don't get it right to the penny. The Python data type for a none variable is called a none type. Kind of odd, but it's nice that it, to be consistent, it does have a type and it's none type. And then it automatically converted the Oracle uh, date to a date time dot date time. That's exactly what we wanted. So again, what are we looking at here? We're looking at each, we looked at the data types of the, of the fields that we got back. And we looked at the metadata uh, of a cursor description to get back the field names that we selected. These are, of course, the same field names that we saw in our query. Field names are not case sensitive. They come back as uh, caps when you look at the metadata. We put them in a dictionary just to, so we can see the association a little more clearly. That's all we've done. And we've seen that we want to do two things differently. We would like to bring back our C lob as a string, not as this whatever CX Oracle.lob is. And we'd like to bring back our rental rate as a decimal data type. So those are two things that we want to do, and that's what our next example will in fact do. So let's move on to our next example. This code is the same as we had before, but one thing that, that's going to be different is that before we execute our SQL, 
I'm going to just go ahead and run this. And we get back um, our set of field names, our set of data types. In this case, I didn't create a dictionary. I just showed the two lists and the five rows that we actually queried from the database. Now, this is specific to CX Oracle, how you do this. We can define off the cursor before we execute our SQL an output type handler, and that's our own method so or function. So it has to have this signature, and if the default type is equal to a character large object, this is the syntax for it, for converting it to a Python string. So this looks like a complicated thing here, but it's actually pretty simple what it's doing. It's just saying for any data type, when I do my query off of this particular um, cursor, I want to convert all C lobs on the Oracle side to strings on the Python side. That's all that says. And then the other thing we did is, if the name is one of these four values, um, then we know in this particular database that that's a monetary value and we want to convert it to Python's decimal. So this is the syntax for doing that as well. Now, how did I find these four fields? There's a lot of fields in this example database. Well, of course, I went back to dBeaver, and I said, hey, can you tell me all the table names and column names and the precision and the data scale, data precision and scale, from all the columns in this schema, where the owner is Sakila, and the data scale is greater than zero. When I do that, I find there's four fields that have a scale of two, which immediately signifies these are probably monetary values. And then when you look at the field names that were chosen, rental rate, placement cost, amount and price, yes, these are in fact fields that represent monetary values. So when we get them back, we're gonna to wanna to get them back as a decimal data type. Again, in your application, that might not matter. Uh, in my experience, because I work with accountants, it, it does matter. Let's go and, and what we did is we defined this output type handler that had to have this particular signature and just just has to have that signature. That's all there is to it. And this is how you convert this data type on Oracle to a Python string. Or if you happen to, you can also use the name of the field. We're going to convert any, uh, if the name is any one of these four values, we're going to convert it to a decimal. And all you do is you set that method. I'm passing again, I'm not calling this method, I'm passing in the name of the method. So this is actually kind of like a callback that happens magically behind the scenes. When you execute the SQL, it will automatically do the conversions for you. So that when we fetch it back, let's see what happens. This is, it's time to run this code. We're now in order to get here, we had that we had to already parse this that the Python interpreter did. So that function is already defined. We can go ahead and set our type handler, execute our SQL. And interesting, behind the scenes, since we're stepping through this, it went ahead and we see it copy calling our function. Even though we didn't see that explicitly, again. It's a little bit of an advanced concept that this is called a callback so that inside of execute, this method gets called. You don't really need to know the details of how this works. You just need to know that this is how you convert data types. And um, I might be able to step over that entirely. Yes, instead of step into, I did a step over and now we did what we, wanted to do let's get the first five rows let's go ahead and get the metadata 
print out that metadata, which in this case, of course, was just the actual field names. Now we're going to look at the Python data types for each value in the first row. Now those data types are consistent. The first value in the first row will be the same data type as the first value in the second row and the first value in the third row and so on, as you would expect. Look at our data types. We got an integer, string, description is now a string. Rental rate is now decimal dot decimal. This returned a null value. We got back a none type. This was a Python date, I mean a Oracle date, and we got back a date time dot date time. So we successfully converted the Oracle data types to the best representation available on Python. We can go ahead and print these. Um, by default, the way I've got it here, we're printing out the entire description, which may be kind of long. And we also see, by the way, that it is a decimal 299 and our date times. Go ahead and just print each of those five rows. And we're done. Um, so a little bit of st string formatting here because string formatting comes up all the time when you're working with a database or other applications as well. I'm going to uncomment out some of this stuff here. And rerun this. Um, let's say put a breakpoint here. Run and debug. And we'll continue on from that point to the next breakpoint. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use the dot format notation here. Now generally I prefer F strings, but when you have when you're trying to print a tuple, it's actually can be easier to use the dot the format. So what is this syntax here? Now we know we selected five fields, and that's what this zero, one, two, three, six fields, four and five are. They represent the position in the tuple that we want to print. If I do star row, row again is a tuple, I can expand it into six variables, and those six variables in the format then get placed into these particular placeholders. So that's called tuple unpacking, the star row. And we're going to print zero, the zero field. That, that would be equivalent, by the way, to row sub zero, um, row sub one. And since this is row, uh, row sub zero is the first value, first column in that result set. It's actually the first column in the first row. This just says in a field of 15, print the first 15 characters. This is a string representation. In a field of 20, print the first 20, and that's it. So just see how this looks. A little bit neater. So we gave this a field of 15, this a field of 20, and truncated it. And we didn't specify anything about these other ones, but they happen to, by default, all line up nice and neat. So that's nice. Let's look at another example. Same thing. Only in this case, um, we're going to print it as a D stands for integer, and we're going to a field of two, so two digits, and we're going to have a leading zero in case it's only one digit. This says represented as a string, um, and the third and values of three was a zero, one, two, three monetary value. You can represent it as a string, and five we're going to represent in its native form, its constructor form which we'll see the date time. So let's go ahead and do that. So we don't see a value yet that in which that we have a leading zero in case like one, two, and three would be zero, one, zero, two, and zero, three. This is the monetary value. This is the date time. Again, just showing off a little bit of pi formatting because 
comes up so often when you're dealing with data from a database. And this format specifiers, again, they're identical for F string. So this time, let's go ahead and do the same thing as we did up above with an F string. Row sub zero instead of the zero placeholder and, and the tuple on packing on format and so on. No difference. And that's it. So what did we just, let's go ahead and finish this program. So again, what did we do? As before, we can, everything in the connection is the same. The way we set up our try accept block is the same for the cursor. We selected fields that have various data types so we can see how they get mapped between the Oracle data type and the Python data type. We created our own custom output type handler. And most of this syntax, you just memorize or cut and paste. The only thing that, was, that we did here is we said, if it's a CLOB, let's make it a Python string. If the field name happens to be one of these, let's make it a decimal.decimal. That's all this type handler is doing. It has to have this particular signature. And yeah, it looks a little strange, but it, it's not that hard to work with. And it actually does make sense if you stare at it long enough. So we did our data type mapping from the Oracle back to Python. And we printed it out in a couple of different ways just because that's what happens. Oftentimes you want to print them out in a particular format or use them in a particular format. And that's all for this particular introduction to CX Oracle.